Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another of the monthly meetings of the Libertarian Alliance. Tonight's talk is entitled The Greens, yes, Science, Science and Libertarianism. Global Warming and, Global warming and, libertarianism. and Libertarianism. In that order. <laughs> yes. So, uh, uh, The Greens, uh, Science, Global Warming and Terrorism. Uh, terrorism? Terrorism, no, Libertarianism. Libertarianism. <laughs> oh, a mistake. Anyway, so. Oh, it's going to be a duller talk now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bad, bad mistake. I'm have to make mistakes. It'll improve after this. Yeah. So uh, we've got, uh, the dreams uh, have revived around about 1965. Uh, of course, the anti-industrial uh, revolution, as, they, as it's now called. I mean, the, this word "industrial revolution" actually is a bit of a misnomer, in my opinion. Uh, but there are anti-industrialized uh, ideologues, Coleridge, Southey. Um, Wordsworth, uh, and ma ma they are mainly in the Tory party of, uh, uh, of Britain, you know, which later became the Conservative party uh, with Robert Peel. Uh, but they more or less uh, died off, and uh, there was no real green movement. Of course, all the green ideas, most of the green ideas are back then, in the tail end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. Uh, but uh, there was no, those ideas, these anti-industrial ideas, more or less uh, fell asleep for a long time. But around about 1965, they started reviving and some of the old uh, stories about uh, scares from industrialization started reviving around about 1965. And uh, for a few of these dreams, really exactly in my generation, around about my age, uh, in Birmingham, I knew for about 20 of them, in fact. And, uh, they had, they had their own little uh, office not far from the centre of Birmingham. Uh, and they were pushing these stories, and they quite frightened me. I mean, uh, all sorts of things were going to happen, and uh, I didn't know any better. Uh, and uh, so I thought that uh, they might be right. But of course, uh, over the next few decades, uh, I realised that, uh, that nearly all of their uh, stories were uh, false. Uh, for example, uh, they, uh, back in 1965, they most certainly said, uh, going on the old uh, petrol companies, and not really looking at what they were quoting, that there's a 30 year, uh, year supply of oil uh, left. Uh, now, say that in 1965. Uh, but of course, what they were going on is the old uh, petrol companies thing of, you know, at these current prices, uh, you know, so on, uh, there's a certain supply of oil and so on. With certain, and they just overlooked the uh, the qualifications, and and they put it forward as the as the, uh, as the dream would like to. You know, in 30 years there'll be no oil, and uh, of course we know that the uh, the whole idea of peak oil, uh, peak oil, of course, was uh, uh, something that happened according to the dreams in the 1950s, <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, they still they still hold that now, strictly speaking, it's the 1950s. They say the oil peaked. Well. Uh, yeah, that's looking. Uh, that's not looking so fine. Uh, but around about that time, uh, in '65, people had an appetite for uh, horror movies. Used to go to the pictures and uh, used to see uh, a lot of uh, horror films, uh, Count Dracula and so on. And uh, what seemed to happen is uh, the dreams seemed to move these horror stories from entertainment, as it were, into uh, news, into the news headlines. And uh, so uh, we had real stories uh, 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 posing as, 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 as catastrophes in, in uh, uh, now along the line uh, over the decades of course all of these the dreams became quite good at uh, predictions but quite bad at, uh, at looking at the uh, the refutation of these predictions uh, so uh, uh, they produced these uh, these uh, stories and the uh, it's a long record of, of failure. Now, of course, the Greens must have heard of that uh, old story of Peter and the wolf, uh, and uh, you know, the boy and the uh, crying wolf in the village. And as the story went, you know, he, he kept crying wolf, and of course, each cry of wolf was realistic. You know, all of these uh, uh, Green stories could happen, uh, but whether they are going to happen or not is another matter. And uh, as we know, with the, the tail end of the story, is that uh, when the wolf finally did uh, appear, and uh, the uh, boy called Wolf, no one believed him. Uh, well, 
I'm not sure that I want to uh, go that far with the uh, analogy of Peter the Wolf, but it does look as if, uh, prior to that, uh, we, we've got a good uh, analogy with the dreams. You know, the dreams keep trying out uh, wolves. They have a certain dream wolves. And uh, none of them seem to uh, manifest themselves. Now, the best uh, candidate for being a, a dream wolf has been global warming, uh, which, of course, they've... Uh, uh, Everyone notes on the fact that they've recently started calling it climate change. And uh, I've tried to find out why, I mean, there's a number of stories why they've changed from global warming to climate change. Uh, one of them is uh, a revival, even in this book, this is a, a middle of the uh, road book. Well, I suppose it's not so much a middle of the road book, but one that uh, veers towards the green side, really, uh, and uh, towards what he considers to be the scientific consensus. Uh, uh, yeah, which in itself is almost a dream term. Uh, and uh, so he actually uh, uh, veers towards the dreams in, in all he says. And um, uh, um, anyway, uh, I'm gonna, uh, well, anyway, the dreams have tried to build up a scientific consensus, and they've tried to use science as though it was a political uh, group. And, of course, the, uh, the IPCC, the international uh, organization that uh, has uh, gathered this uh, information on, uh, to try and get some political action on dream issues, um, is an ideal uh, dream group, really. Um, uh, and uh, it, it, uh, but it took it a long time, uh, indeed only about 10 years ago, I mean, the, the uh, global warming thing has been running since uh, about 1981, 82. Uh, but it was only about 10 years ago, around about uh, 2001 thereabouts, that you started getting, uh, that it started becoming uh, obvious that uh, it was indeed a dream, par uh, 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 a dream paradigm, because, and indeed a politically correct paradigm, because it started uh, coming up with the idea of a global warming denier. Uh, also, uh, you know, there's a, a curious use of skeptics here that I'll like to deal with uh, a bit later on. But uh, what the dreams tried to do is they tried to make science as an authority for political action. Now, of course, science isn't uh, traditionally well suited uh, to be an authority for a political action. Uh, scientists, uh, so science, of course, uh, came from philosophy uh, over the years. Uh, the, uh, if we go back to Greek times, the, uh, the word for uh, philosophy, uh, uh, the, wor uh, the word for what we now call science would be philosophy. Uh, science, of course, is a Latin word uh, for philosophy. And, uh, and uh, so the philosophy is the Greek word, science is the Latin word, and that was... That was, oh, sorry, that was the difference. That was the difference between them. But what happened over the years, of course, is that uh, we had uh, the specialization in sciences and uh, the uh, global view given by certain philosophers who tried to um, give a, you know, the big picture, as it were. And by the time we got to uh, the um, Galileo's time, uh, Galileo was... Uh, uh, quite well trained in mathematics, which uh, not, not all that many, some philosophers were, of course, and Descartes certainly was. Uh, and, uh, but uh, not all philosophers were so well trained in mathematics. Uh, indeed, not all scientists were all so called trained in mathematics, uh, so, so well trained in mathematics. But anyway, you there'd become a, a sort of divorce between science and uh, philosophy in uh, Galileo's time, and Galileo's main works were an attack on Aristotle, but basically an attack on philosophy. Uh, but then, uh, the, uh, so you, you could say by analogy of a divorce, that's, that's when the couple started living apart, as it were. But the actual uh, divorce really came through, I suppose, between science and philosophy uh, in the 19th century with the rise of, uh, of the work in the lab, especially under uh, Pascal in Paris. He, you know, he had a team, a scientific team, and uh, he took a lot of the credit for the team. And that's basically what seems to go on in science now. Nobel Prize is rewarded to uh, the team leader, and uh, a lot of the work has been taken, uh, done by the team. And so science is a more communal affair than philosophy. 
Whereas you have philosophers who still try to write the big picture or some philosophers going for what they call scientific philosophy, you know, specialising in some area or other, or other. But now there's been a divorce between science, science and philosophy, as it were. And, and a, a, a very successful uh, scientist will probably get a footnote, if that, in a textbook on physics or biology or whatever it is, whereas a successful philosopher will have written a number of books outlining the whole, his whole outlook. Now, uh, so, so there is this difference. But however, the public uh, see philosophy as basically a waste of time, I guess. <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, and, and uh, this, uh, this uh, view that the public have of philosophy as being a waste of time um, is not all that inaccurate uh, because there is a sense in which science, uh, philosophy is just ideas for the sake of ideas. Now, what I want to say here is that traditionally, Science was far more like philosophy, and if you like, far more like a waste of time, uh, than than what we uh, than, 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 what, than what the public might think, because the public presently confuse philosophy and technology. But of course, philosophy is quite different from technology. Now, of course, there are uh, some uh, uh, spin-offs from uh, science to technology. Uh, just like there are some spin-offs from philosophy to science. Uh, but basically, I'd say there's more, that more goes from technology to science uh, than uh, the other way around. And I'd also say that more goes from science to philosophy the other way around. So, uh, so technology is the one that... Uh, technology is... When people say science, they tend to think of technology. But anyway, traditionally, uh, science was rather made up of individuals uh, contributing their own critical pieces. It was more or less, what, roughly, what you might call Popperian, although uh, many people say that Popperian, uh, Popperian view of science uh, idealised it a bit. But what happened uh, after 1945, and perhaps before 1945, when a lot of people started going into the sciences, was a bit like what you've got just recently, of course you've got this earlier in America, uh, what's that recently happened in uh, the UK is a lot of people have gone in for college education. Tony Blair tried to get it up to about 50% of college education. And of course, uh, uh, the people who go in, they went in for rather uh, untraditional courses, uh, like uh, you know, how to make breakfast and so on, and, uh, or perhaps media studies. And, and uh, uh, so... Pardon? It's a dog's breakfast. Do I had to make a dog's breakfast, yeah. But... Uh, uh, so what you had is a, somewhat of a do, do, what we might call a dumbing down of, of a college education. Now this, ha this happened, of course, this has happened in the UK just recently, in the last few decades, but it happened earlier in America, uh, this sort of thing. And uh, what happened at the same time uh, in America, I suppose, more so than here, is that a lot of these people went into science as well. Uh, and so you got the rise of what T.S. Kuhn calls normal science. Now this normal science is, is, is an odd sort of phenomenon. Uh, now, uh, Popper, of course, in his, in his debate with Kuhn, uh, just couldn't see what was going on. Uh, it took him ages to see this normal science. And he finally saw it uh, in that uh, Schillip volume, uh, where he replies to Kuhn in that Schillip volume. And he says, uh, well, he says, I must confess, I never saw this normal science, but now I do see it. I think it's a danger of science. And if science really does become normal in your sense, it will be the death of science. Well. I suppose that science was normal in Kuhn's sense, perhaps throughout the, the 20th century, perhaps starting as early as the 1900s, perhaps even in the, in the, in the, in the 19th century, the tail end of the 19th century, uh, where you know, a lot of these people on the team, uh, on Pascal's team, if you like, uh, Pasteur. uh, Pasteur's team, beg your pardon, Pascal, of course, didn't have a team. That's, Pascal is a, an example of a science who was before this team were and uh, just after Galileo, uh, but definitely well trained in mathematics. And uh, so he's a sign of the, the earlier scientists. But I think what, you, what you've got with this normal science, if you, you've got a lot of people who are not pulling their weight on the team, and some are pulling their weight, and some people at the end of the team are getting undue praise when perhaps some members of the team need more praise and so on. But I, I don't think you get a, a situation where there are no uh, good scientists and so on. Uh, I think what, what you're getting is you're getting a lot of uh, people who, as Kuhn says in his 1962 book, who live uh, by science rather than for science. 
Now, I, I think that if you went back to about 1850, nearly everyone in science, not all of them, I suppose, but nearly everyone in science, would live for science rather than by science. And uh, what you've got with normal science is a lot of people not really pulling their weight in science, but conforming to the ruling paradigm. Now, conforming to this ruling paradigm is what we now call politically correct. It is conforming rather than thinking, and it is uh, uh, moving towards um, the dominant theory and not criticizing it as Popper wanted uh, people to do, and as people would have done earlier on, automatically earlier on. Now, there's still a, a few critics, but sometimes these critics find themselves uh, ostracized and so on because they haven't conformed to the... Now, this, this was a movement in science, largely due to more people going into science, I guess, uh, that lent itself to a green takeover. And as I say, this green movement into science began around about 1965. Now, what happened, first of all, is that they had a cool reception. Uh, the editor of Nature at that time was John Maddox, who uh, was an, something of an anti-green. He wrote two books, uh, The Doomsday Syndrome, and then Beyond the Energy Crisis, which were both more or less anti-green books. Uh, well worth reading, actually. And, um, but uh, of course, after he resigned from Nature, uh, then, you know, uh, quite a few of these people, around right about my own age, started moving into these positions of authority. The, the current uh, editor of Nature seems quite uh, stringently green, and, uh, and you know, the greens have moved in. Now, all scientists aren't green, but there are a lot of greens in science. And the, the greens who have gone into science, the question arises whether they put the green ideology first or science first. Uh, uh, you know, as uh, Watley said, the uh, Bishop of Dublin, uh, uh, Archbishop Watley, um, said it makes all the difference in the world whether a man puts the truth in the first or in the second place. And uh, so I think that the, 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 uh, the, the dreams going into science uh, more or less brought out this idea, which is uh, rampant now, that a scientific consensus matters. Now, of course, traditionally, a scientific consensus didn't matter at all. Science isn't about gathering a consensus. It's about trying to uh, move things forward. And um, uh, now, uh, the philosophers of science actually did have uh, a view which more or less fits the modern view, uh, the, Cu the Cunian type view, a bit better than the Popperian thing does, because th they had that view that uh, if once we've justified, uh, if once we've justified a bit of uh, science, then we leave it alone and we move on to something else. But even they had the idea that we move on to something else, or that science is moving on to something else. And, uh, whereas Popper had the idea, of course, that we don't leave things alone. Uh, if, we, uh, if we accept something uh, as part of science, then we continue to try and refute it. Uh, we continue to be critical towards it. Whereas, we know, as we know, the Kuhnian view is that you, you must conform to it and, and keep your mouth shut if you've got any criticisms. I mean, an earlier person who was actually always worth reading, an interesting person, one of the most interesting writers I've ever read, actually, who had the whole Kuhnian idea is, of course, Michael Polanyi, who wrote, who wrote a number of books and, of course, was also a classical liberal uh, to boot, uh, but an uh, extreme subjectivist, and had the, uh, the Kuhnian point, point of view. Uh, and, uh, and he uh, had some chemistry uh, turned down in the tail end of the 19th century. Uh, and uh, in his later books on the philosophy of science, he says, it's right for them to turn me down. You know, it's right for, I didn't conform to the, uh, he doesn't actually say, I didn't conform to the prevailing paradigm, but basically, he says that sort of thing in, in other words. Uh, so he, he goes along with this thing, that he, he thinks that criticism is perverse. Um, now, uh, so we've got, we've got this business then of, 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 uh, of uh, science and consensus, and consensus dictating political action. Now this is alien to traditional science, and I think, it, I think it's alien to actual science, uh, but it's not alien it's not so alien to the Kuhnian type science to conform into a paradigm. And uh, uh, now you had uh, someone like Steve Jones come on, and, and indeed he's not alone. I mean, he's just uh, uh, he's come on saying uh, the media uh, like uh, a debate and so on, and uh, they, they, they uh, choose one of these skeptics. And as far as the public's concerned, uh, this is uh, 
putting him on, to, on uh, par with a consensus scientist, and this is wrong, this shouldn't happen. Uh, it's, uh, it's leveling up the score, but it's not level at all. Uh, the, the skeptics of uh, global warming that are few and far between, and the overwhelming consensus by 80% of the people, uh, uh, support uh, uh, global warming. Uh, now, all this from Jones is, uh, is completely and utterly unscientific and quite contrary to some of the things that he, has, that he sometimes says in some of his books, although he is, uh, uh, he is very, you know, he, Jones himself is extremely, he's more of a political character than he's a scientist. And he, he bent, he's bent over backwards, uh, uh, in, in, even in his brief lectures, uh, uh, to, uh, to say odd things uh, which uh, 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 you know, are, are more to do with politics than with science. Uh, so he, he hasn't got this uh, division between uh, what we might call uh, uh, factual science and, and policy. Uh, now, we know that uh, science will never be able to decide policy, uh, simply because policy is normative, not positive. In other words, it's not about the facts, it's about what we should do. And science um, doesn't decide what we should do. Uh, you know, that is, I suppose, either a political matter or uh, uh, at best, or, uh, or uh, perhaps uh, you know, a matter that shouldn't be done collectively at all, uh, but individually. Uh, now, uh, we now come to global warming. Now, uh, the greenhouse gas, of course, uh, greenhouse gases uh, arose uh, uh, eons ago. Uh, the atmosphere, uh, life give uh, charge, uh, life helped to uh, change, uh, helped to give rise to an atmosphere, as uh, the Gaia theory, I think, fairly well explains, ages ago, uh, whereby uh, some of the atmosphere trapped uh, energy coming in from the sun. So all the energy coming from the sun wasn't getting out, but you had a, 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 an equilibrium uh, roughly akin to a greenhouse, although it's not the same. You know, uh, what, what the greenhouse does is it works uh, by uh, keeping uh, convec uh, convection within the uh, glass walls, and what the, uh, the greenhouse gases does is uh, they uh, uh, limit the amount of radiation that goes back into the, the, the sky after, and, and it's dealing with radiation by the convection. But, but uh, so it's not exactly the same, but the, 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 uh, the, analogy, the analogy has caught on as being used, as, is, as so often is the case, uh, that inappropriate analogies still are used in science. And uh, so we did have a greenhouse effect, which of course, uh, you know, the uh, world would be, uh, the Earth, planet Earth would be about uh, minus 18 if it wasn't for this uh, greenhouse effect on average, and now it's uh, about uh, plus 15. Now we have got this greenhouse effect on, on average. So this makes life uh, comfortable. Uh, 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 but what's happened, according to the dreams, since um, about uh, 1750, is that uh, men started using uh, fossil fuels, and uh, they, they were releasing uh, uh, gases, that, uh, energy that would normally be stored up from the sun in these fossil fuels, and uh, therefore there was a global warming as a result, uh, because, and they especially pick on carbon dioxide, and the reason why they pick on carbon dioxide, which of course is a trace gas and remains a trace gas, although it's, uh, uh, it's very much increased, you know, uh, half of a low number, half of 0.2 cents as it were, it's still 0.4 cents as it were, so that would be, uh, that would still remain a trace gas, it remains a trace gas. The reason why they pick on that is because it is about the only gas that is increasing. Uh, now, uh, their hypothesis is, and uh, it's, it's more or less basic science, as they say, um, that uh, greenhouse gases should, uh, an increase in greenhouse gases should uh, retain some extra energy from the sun. In other words, less energy will get out, and so you'll have an accumulation of energy. Now, um, uh, whilst they, uh, there's two things here, they, they, there is the basic science, which uh, no science is ever sort, sorted by the by, but there's the basic science which is basically sorted, settled, settled well they say settled, no science is really, no science is really settled, there's the basic science, and then there's the feedback of, of, of uh, uh, which, which uh, now, you, you don't have to go into the skeptics, we can have a look at the uh, IPCC itself, it runs many models, not one model, but many models, 
And all these models give different results. But as the IPCC people say, uh, all of the results, every last one of the results, shows, shows some good global warming. Uh, and uh, so uh, the, 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 uh, there's definitely some global warming, and no one has, uh, has really disagreed with that. But what we've had over the last 15 years, as has been pointed out by the so-called sceptics, uh, perhaps we ought to have a word on these sceptics. I mean, the original sceptics, of course, said two things. Uh, the original sceptics 2,500 years ago said two things. One, we can't justify any thesis or any argument. Two, therefore, we should suspend belief. Well, I think the first part of this is perfectly correct. Uh, there's never been any, uh, you know, Papa pointed out, Hume pointed out, there's never been any justification for any statement. Uh, the best we can do is attempted refutation. And uh, we, we, we always have uh, the Popperian duty that Polanyi thought was so perverse that we must still try to keep uh, refuting our own pet ideas. Uh, so we, we retain that Popperian uh, duty. It's not as many people misinterpret Papa as saying, namely that if we uh, don't falsify it, then it's true. Papa never held that. Papa uh, always held that we have a continual uh, duty to try to falsify the pet ideas, no matter how many tests it's passed, uh, just because it might not be true. So that's the actual Popperian uh, view. Uh, not that it's true if we don't falsify it. Uh, it may or may not be true if we don't falsify it. Um, of course, you won't completely and utterly truly falsify a truth, <laughs> obviously. But, but uh, anyway, the... Uh, uh, the, uh, uh... Well, anyway, the, 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 the dreams did try to use a consensus, and uh, I was pointing out this, this idea of scientific consensus is, is if you like, unscientific. Uh, and they're trying to use a consensus to actually drive on policy. Now, the policy they're trying to drive on is this. Uh, as I said, we had a 15-year... Uh, hiatus or law, as some people call it, uh, where there's been no extra global warming, despite the fact that India and China has been pumping out more CO2 than ever before. Now, uh, even before this 15-year-old law, which makes it sound even more safer, makes what I'm going to say in a few minutes even more safer, even when we had continual uh, global warming, uh, the idea that we should uh, get rid of all the uh, CO2 emissions uh, was not really practical because India and China wouldn't go along with it and it was obvious that uh, now they've joined the uh, World Division of Labour the last uh, 30 years or so uh, that uh, they were going to soon become the, 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 the number one polluters and uh, so worldwide there's no way we could get uh, we might have an agreement with the, nor uh, the uh, northern countries even the United States, but we weren't going to get India and China to join this, because uh, why should they? It's not, it's not a good deal for them. It's kind of almost guaranteeing that they won't get the sort of development they want, and that they're going to go for this development, and uh, just like uh, uh, Europe did, uh, in the Britain did in the industrial, in what's called the industrial revolution. So they're going to go for it. So this deal of cutting emissions is not on. Uh, but not only that. Uh, I don't think, you know, I'm afraid I, I agree with India and China that they shouldn't go for it as well. They're right not to, uh, it's not worth the candle for them. And I think it's not worth the candle for the world either. But what you have since then, since uh, about 1997, is you have a, a hiatus, uh, which makes it look even, uh, notwithstanding the fact that India and China have been going hell for leather on this, uh, this hiatus makes it uh, look as though uh, they've not got the feedback right on, on how the world is going to respond to emissions. Now, it's a, this hiatus is a puzzle. Uh, I don't know why there is such an hiatus, uh, but it, it's probably because the uh, feedback systems are more flexible than we thought they were. And it's capable of, the, the, the world as a whole is capable of absorbing more of the CO2 or the effects of it, uh, and uh, it's letting out the radiation uh, as before. So, uh, uh, I think the, uh, 
the policy uh, of, of cutting emissions is not going to work anyway. And if we, if we do do it in the West, it will be a sort of a, a futile gesture because we won't cut over all uh, emissions. And, and, the, the, and the, even if the whole world could cut emissions, what it would do would prevent the world from getting richer later on. Uh, and and uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, result would probably be pretty trivial anyway. Uh, so I think that uh, the, uh, it's, it's, it would be, uh, it's quite right for the world to largely leave this to natural adaption. Uh, natural adaption, of course, is the individuals uh, adapting to things as best as they can. Obviously, you, uh, if you can, uh, uh, get, get more uh, efficient f fuel that uh, that tends to uh, uh, be as little pollutant as possible. The more, you know, the, the less pollutant we are, the better. But all in all, I think that uh, the Greens have attempted to uh, use science as an authority to uh, bully the world into a green, into a green uh, paradigm, as it were. Uh, they happen to court uh, science in a Kuhnian uh, moves, as it were, which made it more uh, made them more welcome there than they otherwise would be. Although they weren't welcome at first, uh, they soon replaced uh, the old scientists, and now they seem to be at the helm. And they're talking about scientific consensus as though it means something. Uh, and uh, traditionally, it wouldn't mean anything. Uh, but anyway, even if it did mean something, it's not science's place to tell people what to do. Uh, so uh, I think that. India and China are quite right to ignore, uh, or to largely ignore, uh, the, uh, the UN uh, movement towards getting a consensus among governments to actually impose laws, by statutory laws, uh, widespread cuts, perhaps up to 80% of CO2 emissions, I think that would be catastrophic. And, uh, uh, and it would ruin the future. Uh, the irony is, is they say, uh, you know, the dreams are, are uh, uh, like people who say, uh, well, my goodness, if we don't start riding uh, push bikes now, the time will come uh, when we'll have to ride push bikes. So we ought to ride push bikes now. <laughs> but I say this, if I've got to ride a push bike, I don't mind riding one. But if I'm doing something, when I could, if I'm riding a push bike when I could uh, drive a car, then I'm not so fond of riding push bikes. So, uh, if, you know, if we continue economic growth, what we've had in the last 300 years is each generation gets better and better off. I think the only thing that uh, cutting greenhouse emissions, emissions to the extent of 80% would do is to end that. Uh, of course, there are a lot of people in the media who think it's really ending anyway. Uh, now, I think that they're deluded so I think the, the, the real income uh, is still going up, although I, I think the paid wages have slumped a bit, but that's largely owing to the growth in welfare and the fact that a lot of taxation is paying for uh, dead-end jobs like you know, uh, you know, National Health Service and so on. <laughs> but you shouldn't call that dead-end jobs. Well, but, but, it ends in death. <laughs> but but, 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 uh, yeah, but government jobs and so on, and th they're taking a... Uh, uh, you know, because of taxation, this has made a slight uh, law in the advances of money wages since about 1970. However, the real standard of living isn't uh, the actual money wages, it's what the money wages can buy. And we know that owing to progress and so on, we can buy things now that weren't even around 10 years ago. So therefore, I think the standard of living continues to creep up. But if we have uh, the uh, carbon emissions um, 80% uh, cut, I think that will put an end to the, uh, the progress for the first time in 300 years. And that will be a, a great pity. And that's the reason why I think uh, that we're not going to have it. Uh, but anyway, India and China are going to ignore it. And so presumably we'll get some progress in India and China. Very good. Not before time. Before I go to the lavatory, um, of course, if there are any real reason to worry about CO2 emissions, the people who were worried about it, whilst hoping to maintain um, an industrial society of a kind, they don't deny there should be an industrial society of a kind, they would be gung-ho for a nuclear power, you would have thought. 
it's disgusting. But they hate nuclear power because it represents progress. You see, they hate they hate nuclear power because, it, and of course, they even hate the technology that gives rise to the bicycle because we know the ball bearings in the bicycle uh, demand a, 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 a industrial society to actually produce these ball bearings. So the, the bicycle, although it seems primitive, is in fact a, 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 an industrial good. Uh, but you, we, but it, does, it still does. Uh, uh, you know, some. I mean, the Greens are a mixed bunch, of course. Some of them uh, uh, prefer, like technology, uh, and but they want it to be green technology. Uh, and, but some of the others of them absolutely hate technology. I mean, they're, they're a bit like the vegetarians. You know, you have vegans who won't touch animals at all. You know, they they they, uh, they won't have even milk or eggs or anything like that. And uh, and then you have the ordinary vegetarians who'll. Uh, who will have dairy products and stuff and the cheese and stuff. So, so uh, the greens are a mixed bunch. They're a hell of a mixed bunch. Good job, because otherwise uh, we'd be in for, you know, if they were a solid block, we'd, uh, we'd have problems with them, more problems than we've got already. So, <coughs> Really, just seems to be uh, statistical correlations. Oh, yes. It seems to be an awful lot of uh, reporting. In fact, bizarre statistical correlations. Yes. Without any explanation, this causing the effect. Yeah, you know, you'll read in the papers day after day that yeah, we, we follow you know, thousands of people over 70 years and we record it. How many times they fast in the afternoon? And uh, <laughs> we've learned so far in the afternoons have a consequent with 10% reduction in breast cancer. Yes. Years. And uh, people, but there's no explanation. <laughs> that may or may not be true. And it's, it's remarkable how they carry out these statistical yeah, It always was like that. Who they get to go along with it, but it doesn't seem to be science. There's no that. explanation of how the one thing leads to another. Um, especially in nutrition, there seems to be all kinds of... Uh, yeah, it always, it always it always was like that. I mean, if you look at uh, the earlier... Uh, it always was that they, they saw a correlation, they send it in. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, one of my uh, heroes is Joseph Priestley. Uh, and uh, very often, you know, he... he, he um, he sent things in, which he knew may or may not be, be developed by other scientists. And uh, you know, again, uh, you know, you, whenever you get a, 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 a uh, uh, an outline of Priestley's uh, discovery of oxygen, you know, nearly always the modern scientists, because they're always thinking of uh, priority and so on, which of course Priestley wasn't thinking of. And they say how foolish he was to actually uh, show his hand to Lavoisier and so on. But of course, Priestley's whole outlook was which was brought a lot of these correlations and made a of these correlations to send it off and see if someone else can make something of it. So you have had, for a long time, just mere correlations being reported in, in some scientific journals. Uh, uh, you know, it's, not, it's not new, but, but uh, uh, what you are getting, you see, more and more in science is, is this political correctness. Is, is, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's very important to promote women now, all of these scientists, uh, uh, the Cunian type scientists, promote women to, to almost anything, and you know, it's a good in itself. So, so, is science searching for the truth, or is it searching for equality? Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, you know it's, it's, a lot of, uh, and a lot of uh, science is searching for equality of jobs in science and so on. In other words, a lot of this thing has gone uh, like normal science, and normal science is equality and so on. And, uh, uh, but, but correlations, yes, they always were a bit flimsy with correlations. And this was brought Hume's uh, critique of post hoc ergo propter hoc, you see, which is just as valid as we more or less said today as ever. Uh, but uh, we probably are getting more of them today ever, uh, than ever because there are more scientists today than ever. But they always were keen on, on correlations, on just correlations, just, just to see if someone else could make something of it. And you know, eventually, of course, if, if, if something did become of it, then eventually, uh, uh, you know, the textbook would try to give it some sort of theoretical foundation if it made its way to the textbook. But most of these observations of correlations will never make themselves into the textbook. They'll just, you know, they'll just be correlations, and they'll be found to be just correlations. But you know, it is science is uh, you know, uh, think now, uh, you know, send in now and uh, and reconsider later. Type thing, yeah. And so, if you just see a correlation, it will send it in, and that's been so over the last three hundred years of science. But there's more of it today because there's more scientists. Yeah. 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 
Hmm. One thing that's been said about libertarians and Greens is that we are, um, there's, a, there's, a, you know, there's a great deal of skepticism or denial uh, about uh, the Green movement and how to prevent climate change yes. amongst libertarians. Oh, no, it is and we're, what, what we're usually told is that we're, we're simply just trying to uh, deny the facts uh, so that to fit our theory. Yeah, <laughs> denialism, yes. Well, denialism is, is a denialism. Because, because obviously what's required is unlibertarian action in order to uh, stack it because you can't tolerate that. Well, denialism is a political correct idea. It's an idea, and and the idea is is that uh, you know people that, that people will uh, think as they like, and if they want to deny something, they'll deny it. But of course, no human being can do that. I mean, it's contrary to human nature. What a human being does, uh, he, I mean, he might keep it under his hat. But what a human being does is he assesses the truth of the situation, and. Uh, now, it might not pay him to actually uh, say what he thinks is the truth of the situation. Uh, and indeed, he, he, uh, I mean, a lot of, uh, I'm not saying that uh, all science goes by belief. I think Popper here is, is right to, uh, to say that uh, belief, go, uh, you know, we use hypotheses in science, you know, which we don't believe. I mean, for example, Einstein didn't believe his theories. He always thought he could do better. And of course, with his theory of, uh, his uh, relativity, special theory of relativity, he did do better with the general theory some 10 years later. Uh, and, uh, he, but he, he wasn't satisfied, then he thought he could do better. He was going through his theory of everything which he thought would do better, his universal theory, and he was going for that for the rest of his life. And people lost uh, uh, tolerance with him because they thought he shouldn't go for that. It was, too, it, was, it was before his time and there wasn't enough data and so on. But nevertheless, he didn't believe in relativity. Uh, but he thought it was a better hypothesis than the earlier ones. And he did think that it refuted Newton's hypothesis. So science is like that. It can go by a, It doesn't have to go with belief. However, I do think that belief is a good heuristic. And I do think that uh, uh, belief will help you test things out. And uh, you know, the uh, uh, Popper says you learn through uh, falsification. But of course, you only learn uh, if you uh, believe in the theory that's falsified. Then you're shocked by it. And then you will learn far better than what you'd do if you were fairly indifferent to it and you don't see the force of the... So I think, uh, in this sense, I do think that the Kuhn's commitment thing uh, does make for better science. It's, uh, it's, uh, if someone is a committed person to something or other, he will care and uh, worry about criticism a lot more than someone who's indifferent to criticism. Uh, you know, I think that's true. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and and uh, you, you, so if you get a complete ideologue and you criticise him, you, want, you might even lose sleep over it. <laughs> Whereas someone who's indifferent will probably won't lose sleep, any sleep over it. Uh, so I think there is something to be said for commitment. Uh, but uh, we know, that, uh, don't we, that belief is not, uh, belief is only what the subject thinks is true, it's not necessarily what is, what is actually true. And so you, 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 uh, uh, you must always uh, test and retest, see what you can do in science, as Papa says. It sounds like you're contrasting a sociology of science with a logic of science. Uh, yes, uh, I think that Kuhn was good on the sociology of science and uh, Papa was good on the logic of it. And it should be remembered that Einstein said, well, a hundred German professors have written a book against him or learned a paper against him. He said, why all these books, one fact will refute you. <laughs> yes, that's right, yes. And yes, sir. And, uh, and of course, yeah, the consensus doesn't matter. Yeah, this is, I mean, this consensus is really an alien idea to science. But, you know, it's the democratic theory of truth. And again, democracy has uh, got a privileged position in, in, in current society. People uh, can't see anything wrong with it. And uh, they, so they, but to use the democratic theory of truth is a straightforward fallacy. Just like playing to the gallery is a straightforward fallacy. In fact, it's a similar fallacy to uh, playing to the gallery. Playing to the gallery is saying what you know other people will be pleased with uh, the democratic theory of truth is to go along with what the majority think. But it, you know, it's, it's got no, no bearing whatsoever on what the truth will be. And it's not scientific, it's a, it's a logical howler. Um, um, but, you know, uh, I mean, the, the, the real thing to do is, to, as Popper says, the logic of it is to keep retesting. Keep, you know, science is an activity that doesn't rest, it continually tests. But of course, this is no good for uh, 
you know, what they need is a consensus. You must go along with the consensus. That's their idea. But that idea, I think, is alien to real science or to traditional science anyway. Science before Kuhn. Well, science before, say, I don't know, uh, 1890. But um, going back to the idea of Lumiatianism and, uh, and what you've just said about the consensus, if they are negative consequences of global warming, for instance, for people who live uh, in uh, low-lying areas by the sea or, uh, you know, areas that could be made, um, uh, you could suffer from drought or, or whatever the consequences are. Yeah. And if I am a good libertarian insurance company, I either have to make a decision that this won't happen and I don't increase my premiums, but then I risk having to pay large amounts of money when consequences arrive, or I have to take a view and increase my premiums and risk losing clients or whatever. Um, what do judges or lay people do in this case? They ask for witnesses. So you don't have a democratic uh, consensus that leads to truth. But if you have one, two, three, four, five witnesses that say, yes, this is happening, or this was what happened, you can't ignore the five witnesses because one witness said, um, well, no, it's not happening. So, uh, in, in, in pure science, of course, the one witness or the one scientist that is against all the others may be right. But we are talking libertarianism, we are not talking science. So we are talking people who have to make decisions. You know, do we build a nuclear reactor? Do we ensure this, that, or the other? Do we plant certain seeds in certain areas? in anticipation of global warming or not. But we have to make an act, we have to make decisions on this. Well I don't, I don't think the um, I don't think the four witnesses and the one witness is all that germane here. Of course we've got to make uh, decisions on what on why it is happening and there's either global warming or, or there's not. I mean I, I, I've said nothing about that really. All I've said is that uh, to to cut uh, carbon emissions by eighty percent is sure is going to ruin not only people in the advanced world but people in the backward world as well. It's going to it's going to ruin everyone. In other words, that's certain. Uh, now it's true that we're going to take a chance by ignoring it, by allowing carbon dioxide to go up, and and that's going to have some bad results presumably. Well, the best thing we can do is to adjust as possible as uh, uh, as much as we can to these bad results, no matter how bad they are, uh, because if we do the green thing about it, then we're definitely going to out, we're going to bring disaster on ourselves. Now, disaster might come on us anyway later on, uh, but it will come gradually, and we will be able to adjust to it as we see it, as we see fit. Now, the libertarian view isn't that we have government and government decides this. The libertarian view is that individuals look after themselves in so far as they can, or they volunteer on a free basis with other individuals in organisations. Oddly enough. The um, United Nations uh, IPCC is almost like a voluntary organisation. I mean, they very often sell it as a consensus politics. But if you actually look at it and look at the history of it, it is, uh, you know, me being, uh, uh, you know, I might be a young man uh, studying physics or climatology or something, and I'm being asked for a contribution to this. Uh, UN prestigious, so I give my contribution. I don't necessarily agree with all the other chaps on it. So you've got about two thousand chaps, and the UN IPCC itself says all these people are in agreement with it. But we know, and we can see any number of them, a whole bunch of them now are skeptics. There's no shortage of ex-people that are in the skeptic movement telling them that they didn't agree in the first place, and so on. So we know that these people are voluntary, and they don't particularly agree. Uh, they have their own views, they have some sort of views, something going on and so on. They have some sort of interest in it. But the, it is not, most certainly not, a consensus as, a, as it's sold as a consensus. It, uh, and, it's, and as it's interdisciplinary, the Kuhn, you see, you do get 
a Kuhnian consensus within physics or a Kuhnian consensus within biology and so on, you get the dominant paradigm and so on. You don't get that in the uh, IPCC uh, 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 panel because that isn't one discipline, it's many disciplines. You know, it's, it's fucking people. And so you, you talk, you actually have a look at the internet and it's full of these experts who have dropped out and become renegades. And they'll tell you that they didn't agree with it at, at any time. So it's presented as a consensus, but in actual fact, we know that that, for sure, is not a consensus. It's far well, more consensus. Well, it's usually when economics. they're retired and their pension is safe and they can speak their mind without any threats to their career. Well, there's a question at the back there. Right? Yes. Uh, what would be the libertarian point of view to nuclear power, especially from a liability insurance point of view? So let's say someone decides to buy a piece of land just three kilometers away from me and build a nuclear power station there. Well, uh, yeah. there's a libertarian called Petra Beckman who bowled us all over. In fact, I, I, at one stage I had about 70 of these books and I was passing them around. I've now got one, <laughs> one, one left over. Uh, uh, and uh, I only met one person who wasn't bowled over by this book. And Beckman uh, presented the case for nuclear power. The title of the book is, came out in 1976. It's called The Health Hazards of Not, in capital letters, Going Nuclear. And uh, he, uh, he thought that, uh, first of all, he thought that Greens were more or less messing up uh, nuclear power for the market because they were actually uh, making too many uh, safety conditions and so on, making nuclear power very expensive, more expensive than it normally would be. But he did argue that it was safe, the safest form, even without these extra things, you know, uh, it was the safest form of, uh, of uh, generating less, uh, electricity. And he thought the market could be found for it and would be found for it if you, uh, if, if he himself and, uh, won the day and he, he presented the case that looked likely to win the day. I mean, uh, nearly everyone, I think everyone who's read this book has been impressed by it. I, I was, uh, when I picked it up, I thought I was frightened of nuclear power when I picked it up. Afterwards, I thought I was, a, I thought, well, uh, when I picked this book up, I was like an ignorant savage. Now I know that nuclear power is. It's safe. You know. uh, it's, it really is a, 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 a tremendous, uh, a tremendously well-written book, and sells nuclear power to almost anyone uh, who, who hates it. You know, you know, uh, and, and it removes your fears of nuclear power. But he thought, yes, the market could uh, you know, dominate it, make a profit. And, and uh, uh, but first of all, the battle against the dreams and against the scaremongering over nuclear power had to be won in order f for. Uh, you know, the climate to, be, to, to make it, the market embrace this. But he thought it could be done on the market. Yeah, because the interesting point about nuclear power station in uh, France or UK or a lot of other countries is the state basically ensures that. Yeah. So if it would be on free market, that perhaps the nuclear power station would be way more modern or better insured or better quality and safer as a result. Well, I mean, you'd, you'd, have to private, you'd have to privatize these. Uh, Nuclear power stations, ideally. Uh, well, and if you privatise them there, then uh, the state will still be responsible for uh, damages uh, greater than four billions, as far as I know. Uh, yeah, that, that, I mean, you know, privatisation now has become, uh, you know, broad shaped. I mean, uh, well, yeah, but of course, you know, if you really, if you really privatise the product, you know, say for example, we did privatise the railways. Uh, then to privatise and then stipulate that there must remain railways, well, that's not a real privatisation. You know, the real privatisation is you're going to sell off the land where the railways are on and whoever buys them can turn them into motorways or can, you know, do what he likes with them. He, there he is. But whereas what you've got is partial privatisation with the government uh, still trying to hold control. Well, you know, as I say, there's privatisation and there's privatisation. The libertarian privatisation is privatisation, i.e., get the stay out of it, and no regulations. But that's uh, a different, a different privatisation. It's an interesting point as to whether um, the libertarian society, you would have to insure yourself against things you don't believe could possibly happen. Um, who's going to demand this of you? Why is, I mean, you can simply say, look, if the things go wrong, I lose all my possessions and my shareholders do this possessions or my partners do and that's it that's all you get out of us what, what, what do you want well kill us i mean you know, skins off our backs hang us uh, you know, okay you can do that but but why should 
Why should the, the public at large be taxed? Oh. Why should the threat of tax hang over the public at large in case a little power station goes, goes wrong? Not that it didn't. Apart from a Russian one, which insisted on turning off all the safety controls and trying an experiment that no one required it to try, and then it went badly wrong. And even then, as the author Patrick Beckman referred to said, it's still the most safe way per kilowatt hour of energy to produce energy. Yeah. Well, Beckman wanted you to compare Chernobyl with a mining, coal mining accidents. And he says they pretend that uh, they, they quite rightly see that the fallout from Chernobyl goes around the world. You know, it's spread even the all I mean, the point that they make is CO2 goes all around the world. All these pollutions go all around the world, including the fallout from a, a big mining accident. We've had a terrible mining accident just a, a few weeks ago in Turkey. Well, the dropout from that goes around the world, just like from Chernobyl. But they don't talk about that. They, don't do, they, 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 they talk about the, the, the fallout from Chernobyl you know, around the world, but not from that terrible place in Chernobyl. And of course, the, the, the people who lost their lives in Chernobyl, how I many, well, there were a few, weren't there? Uh, but not, not, not as many as in Turkey just, uh, just uh, about five weeks ago. Uh, and, you know, coal is, uh, uh, is far more dirty uh, and uh, far more uh, uh, destructive than nuclear power. As I mean, Beckman is, if you haven't read Beckman, uh, sadly he's dead now. Uh, uh, but if you have read anything by Petra Beckman, he's, he's also written a, uh, a history of pi, by the way, which is the mathematical number pi. That's also a, 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 you know, a, a very good uh, uh, read as well. Everything he, wrote, everything he uh, writes is worth reading. He really is a joy to read, old Beckman. I should jump in with the question. In the whole of this, not your talk necessarily, but the um, concern with uh, CO2 and the rest of it, it used to be global warming, then when it wasn't warming, it was changed to climate change. And since the climate may be naturally fluctuating anyway, that is a hypothesis always going to be, in one sense, not refuted, because there's going to be variation in local climates. That's always going to be the case. However, in all of this discussion, or most of it, the consideration is never that industrialization has its consequences. But it also has its benefits. Is there a net loss in this? And of course the answer is no. There's not a net loss. Industrialization saves lives, prolongs lives, makes for less unpleasant long lives. Your children don't die before your eyes. This is a you know, quite a considerable gain. And it's been progress from one, you know, what, what we've had. So, so it's ha it will have to be something very bad indeed to tell you that this is the wrong way to go, which is why they have to try and conjure up somehow something very bad indeed but it doesn't seem to be happening it doesn't seem to be very bad it seems to be a mere side effect of things improving around the world so of course one of the one of the uh, this change everyone talk, talks about the change from uh, global warming to climate change and uh, in this book and in other green books because I, I like to read the opposition if I can uh, their explanation is that they, they are not really uh, totally uh, unsympathetic to the people who said there'd be a freeze in the 1970s. And they do think as well that there's going to be a big freeze in the future. So, when, so we know their next, their, probably their next horse will be back to global cooling. It could be, you know, because you've had this 50, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen of course, but we've had this 15 years now of, uh, of, uh, uh, of a lull or a pause. And if you do start if it does start dropping, it may well revive the old, uh, the, old the earlier dream wolf of, uh, of uh, global cooling. Uh, because uh, many experts do say, uh, it's funny, you know, when I first started reading this sort of stuff in, in 1965, in reaction to the dreams that I knew then, uh, there were two lots, there was the uh, people like Maddox were called optimists, and the dreams were called pessimists. But they seem to swap over horses, because people like Maddox used to say, uh, Humans aren't making things worse, but if they were, we couldn't do anything about it, so that's it. Whereas the pessimists said, humans are making things worse, but then they switched to optimists, and we can do something about it. <laughs> so, the thing is, we can uh, cut carbon emissions by 80%. It's possible we can do that, but if we do that, we'll ruin bloody modern society. <laughs> do we want to do that? Uh, well, India and China's got the answer. They don't, they're not going to follow us if we do it. 
anymore. That's it. Oh well, I'd like to thank David McDonough for an interesting and unstimulating talk. Yes.